Phil Muscatello and FinPods are authorized reps of Money Sherpa. The information in this podcast is general in nature and doesn't take into account your personal situation. Shares for beginners. Weekend watch list. G'day and welcome back to Shares for Beginners Weekend Watch List, where we take a close look at an individual company that you may wish to consider for your watch list. It's not a recommendation to buy, but a way for you to learn how Stockopedia screens for value. Joining me today is Chris Batchelor, and we're talking Seven Group Holdings Limited, ASX code SVW, and it's the 46th largest company on the ASX, Chris, so we're talking about a heavyweight here, aren't we? Indeed, indeed we are, Phil. It's a very interesting company too. So let's start with the role of the Stokes family. They've been intimately involved with this for a long period of time now, haven't they? That's right. They have indeed. And in fact, they own 57% of the shares on issue. It's largely controlled by billionaire Kerry Stokes and his son, Ryan Stokes, is the CEO. So if you get on board with this company, you need to realise you're getting on board with that family. So where do we start with this company? We've only got 20 minutes. It's a huge diversified business. Give us a bit of an overview or as much of an overview as you can give in a few short moments. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so yeah, as you said, it is a diversified operating and investment group is how they describe themselves. So what that means is they do own businesses outright, and that's really the biggest component of their business, but they also invest in other businesses. And yeah, some they own outright, some they'll have a controlling interest and others they'll have a non-controlling or a smaller interest. It's very important also not to confuse the Seven Group Holdings with Seven West Media. So Seven West Media is a separate listed business and they own the media assets such as the Seven Television Network as well as a newspaper and publishing company and they're just moving into radio. However, just to muddy the waters even further, Seven Group Holdings owns 40% of Seven West Media. So it can be <laughs> oh, a hence, bit confusing. Hence why it was in the annual report. I was going through the annual report last night. I'm going, how does this operate? How does this work? So it's a 40% holding in Seven exactly. West or Seven Media. That's a minority holding. However, obviously, it's 40% is still quite a significant stake. But the biggest component, actually, of Seven Group, let's just call it Seven Group, the things, if things clear, is West Track. Now, West Track is a business that is wholly owned by Seven Group, and they are the sole authorised dealers of Caterpillar equipment for Western Australia, New South Wales, and the ACT. And if you think about Caterpillar, it, Caterpillar is the firm that make those huge mining trucks and other mining equipment. So, you know, think mining trucks that are as big as a house. They're often made by Caterpillar, and West Track have the rights to distribute those in as I said, Western Australia, New South Wales, and ACT. That business contributes about half of the group's revenue, or just over half. But they also own some other well-known businesses. For example, Coates Equipment Hire. I'm sure you've all seen Coates Equipment out when you're passing roadworks and construction sites and so forth. That's a large business too, that, and they own the whole of that business. So Coates controls about 25% of the market share for that equipment hire style of um, of business. Now, they also own 72% of Borrell, and listeners will be familiar with Borrell. They're li independently listed in its own right under the code BLD, and they're a company that supply building materials, specifically cement, concrete, asphalt. Now, SGH have a controlling stake in that because they own 72%, and that means that they're actually required to bring 100% of Borrell's revenue onto their income statement despite only owning 72%. And then they make an adjustment for those minor minority interests at the bottom line. So those three businesses, they make up what they call the industrial services segment of the business. And they're obviously the, the biggest contributors to the business, but there are two other important segments to also take into account. They are the energy segment and a media segment. So energy, they have some of their own assets that they own outright in the energy sector, but they also own a 30% stake in another listed company, which is Beach Energy, code BPT. And uh, Ryan Stokes is actually the, the interim chairman on the board of Beach. They are looking for a, a permanent chairman, but right now he's the interim chairman. So obviously has a lot of control influence over that business. And then the other component media, as we mentioned at the top, they own 40% of Seven West Media. 
So that's that's sort of the spread of investments they have over a number of different segments. And what what are your thoughts on um, Ryan taking over the family business? And because sometimes there can be problems in uh, succession management. Um, I guess he must be up to the task. Yeah, I think so. I, mean, I was thinking about this: the the difference between him and some of the other family businesses where the, the reins have been passed down is that he has been running this business for a long time. So he's been intimately involved. So when the day comes for him to completely take over, it won't be a shock to him. He knows what he's getting himself in for. He's proven himself over many years. And so it won't be a shock for other shareholders either. Uh, so I think yeah, he's been well-groomed for the role. And yeah, I, I don't see it as a problem in this particular instance. Do you see the diversification as being something that's hard to handle or it's something that they manage well? What are your thoughts on that? Looking at their results, they manage it very well. Kerry Stokes was behind Seven Media in the early days. So they obviously have a very good understanding of that business. And I think they've, they're have they very good at allocating capital. So you can sort of think of this business as an investment firm. What they do is they take their capital they allocate it to the various businesses, but then they let the managers of those businesses run those businesses and they give them a lot of control and autonomy in running those businesses. Their expertise really is in providing that guidance, that oversight, and, and of course the capital. And I think they're doing that very well. So yeah, I mean, an interesting example for ex- is Borrell. They bought that not too long ago, a couple of years ago. They owned like 73% and they bought it at a much lower price. It has since done really, really well. And they offloaded a small stake. They wanted to offload about 3%. I think they only managed to get rid of 1%. But nevertheless, they sold at a big profit and you know, just booked some profit for their own shareholders. So from Stockopedia's perspective, what do the financials look like? Yeah, well, the numbers are looking very shiny. It's got an overall stock rank of 90, which puts it in the top 10% of businesses. And that's uh, really supported by the quality score, which is 94. Now, if you look at the business over the long term, they really have been a strong source of value creation, and they've significantly outperformed the market. Their dividends have actually steadily increased for 30 years, which is quite a remarkable track record. So they're they're kind of like a dividend aristocrat, I guess, in that sense. Yeah, that's right. They are indeed. And their 10-year total return is around four times that of the market. So they really are doing uh, very well with that wealth generation for their shareholders. If we look at their underlying uh, earnings before interest and tax, or EBIT, it's gone from $303 million back in uh, FY16 up to $1.2 billion in the most recent year. And that's a, a compounding annual growth rate of 22%. So they're you know, really solid long-term numbers. The last year, FY23, when they released their results back in mid-August, they were really strong results. Overall, revenue grew 20%. This was largely driven by West Track, where sales were up 24%. And as I mentioned, that's the biggest component of the business. But also, Borrell had revenue up 17%. Coates had revenue up by 13%. Now, with this business, you just got to be aware that you need to look at the earning. I mean, you do have every business, but there's a disconnect between revenue and earnings with this business to some extent. And that's because, as I mentioned, with a company like Borrell, they consolidate all of the revenue onto their income statement because they own a controlling interest. With a company like Seven West Media, none of that revenue goes onto their uh, income statement because they don't control it. So what they do do is they bring in their share, 40% of the net profit, of Seven West Media onto their bottom line. So it it doesn't affect the top line, but it does affect the bottom line. If we then look at EBIT, which is a a good measure of earnings for this company, we can see that overall it grew by 20%, but the three big contributors, West Track, Coates and Borrell, they were up 33% for the year, whereas the energy segment declined 26% and media declined 23%. So a very clear... um, distinction over the last year between where the money was made and where it wasn't. In fact, if we look at Seven West Media a bit more, we can see that they also had to write down the value of their investments by $76 million. And that's on top of the previous year where they wrote down $83 million. 
they are expecting TV earnings to stabilize in the coming year. But you know, as anyone who's followed the media segment in recent years knows, TV in the traditional sense has struggled. Eyeballs have moved towards yeah, digital types of platforms. And so the advertising dollars have followed them and TV has indeed struggled. Yeah. Oh, the other thing I was going to touch on in terms of the financials is the operating cash flow. They generate lots of cash. They've generated 1.6 billion in the last year, and that was up 55% of the prior year. Their debt is a little bit on the high side, but because of their strong cash flow, they're able to service that debt and they have indeed been paying it down. Are you picking shares on gut instinct? Buying on press tips or rumours, do you struggle to find the time to keep up with the research and analysis that goes into evaluating potential stocks? Stockopedia are pleased to offer a special deal to listeners of this podcast, a 14-day free trial and a 10% discount on the first year of membership. Sign up now at y.stockopedia.com sfb. There's no better time to access the most comprehensive, easy-to-use investing toolbox for DIY share investors. 10% off, 14-day free trial, and a 30-day money-back guarantee. That's y.stockopedia.com slash sfb. So with a write-down, and this is just something that I've uh, come across recently and that I've learnt, is that um, when there's a write-down in asset values, that actually gets reflected in the profit report, doesn't it? That's correct, yeah. Um, and what you'll find a lot of companies do is they use a term called underlying profit, where they'll exclude the write-downs. But the official statutory profits, so the one that they're required to produce, has to include those write-downs. In the Stockopedia score, the one score that's not looking great is value. And I, I guess that's something with a business like this. When a business is so strong, it's hard to get it at a good price at any particular time. What? How does that? Um, how should that be reflected in an investor's point of view as per this company? Yeah, that's right. You'd be very lucky to find this company at a discount. However, it's not super expensive. So by that, what I mean is if we look at something like the PE ratio, it's 14, the forward PE ratio. Yeah, 14 is not cheap, but nor is it hideously expensive. It pays a decent dividend, but the yield's only 1.7%. But in in this case, you're probably not too worried about that because they've proven very effectively that they're able to reinvest their earnings and generate stronger profits than you probably could if if the profits were paid out to you as a shareholder. Yeah, the value score is a bit on the low side, but it's not like ridiculously expensive. And and a business like this, yeah, you know, we'd all love to pick it up cheap. And I'm the same. I look at it thinking, when can I get it for a good price? And the answer is probably never. <laughs> like the market's not going to wait for that. It'll be a good price if you bought it five years ago, huh? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, what's the outlook for the company? What um, what are we seeing looking forward? Yeah, very positive. In fact, they had their um, AGM recently, on the 16th of November, they upgraded their forecast earnings for FY24. So they were initially forecasting EBIT growth in the range of sort of 8 to 12%, whereas now they've upgraded that to be um, low to mid-teens, you know, 10 to 15% sort of numbers. So that's very positive. They've had a very strong first quarter, particularly across that industrial services segment, West Track has started FY24 very strongly with increasing demand for support as well as a strong order book and sales pipeline. Interesting to note that Westrack actually make the majority of their money from servicing all that equipment, um, but they do still make a, a large portion from new sales as well. There's also been strong activity in the infrastructure and construction sectors, which supports Coates. And indeed, the New South Wales budget outlined a 14% increase in infrastructure spending over the next few years. So that, again, provides more support for Coates. Uh, They're working to improve profit margins, so it's not just a revenue story. They are getting better at retaining more of their profit. Borrells had a very strong start to FY24, and they themselves, as an independent business, have have announced an upgrade to their earnings guidance for FY24 and are expecting to make 300 to 330 million which should be around about double-digit EBITDA margin. So again, not just revenue, but improving margin. And the market itself is forecasting EPS growth of 6.6%. Now, that's a bit down on what the company are reporting. Uh, That 
may reflect a bit more conservatism in the market, which is fair enough. Management tend to be more optimistic, but either way, it's they're still good numbers. So yeah, the outlook is looking quite strong. And the share price has really rallied hard in the last month, I think, as a, a re- um, reflection of that particular sentiment. And of course, there's always risks. What are the risks as you see them? Yeah, of course there are. And I guess th- to understand the risks with this business, you first just want to think about, well, what are they exposed to? What are their major exposures? Now, obviously, that industrial services is the, the bigger side to their business. And so that side of the business is exposed to mining. It's in sp- exposed to infrastructure and general construction. Uh, and there's also exposure to the sort of transitional energy market. So I'll talk to each of those in turn. Based on their most recent figures, about 40% of the group is exposed to mining production through West Track. But one thing that's worth noting is that that uh, exposure tends to be to the amount of, or to the volume of earth moved, not so much to commodity prices. So commodity prices, as everyone knows, can be quite fickle and um, companies have no control over it. They are governed by global markets. And, and that um, determines the price of most um, uh, commodity or resource companies, doesn't it? That's right. So, But what West Track is more exposed to is what are the production volumes going to be like. And whilst they're certainly influenced by um, commodity prices in the longer term, in the short term, companies set their targets for how much production they're going to do, and they continue to dig that up within reason. I like your um, analogy that it's just about the the amount of dirt that they move rather than the price of the commodity. It's a nice way of putting it. Yeah, that that's right. Yeah. So yeah, if you've invested in a great big truck, then you're going to fill it up. Just because the price fell 10%, you still need to fill that truck up with, with uh, dirt. <laughs> basic, basic economics. <laughs> They're also, they're quite well positioned to capitalize on the expansion in lithium and other battery minerals. So whilst their main exposures are iron ore and coal, they are also exposed to some of the other minerals. Aside from that, at about 45% of the group's earnings are exposed to infrastructure and construction activity, largely through coats and borrow. This is an interesting area. Infrastructure Australia forecasts that they're going to spend 1.2 trillion over the next five years. There's obviously a huge amount of investment in this space, but of course we had the federal government come out just last week and slash a whole lot of infrastructure projects, right? So there is certainly risk around infrastructure. There's a certainly a feeling that it was overdone during the pandemic and that a lot of that infrastructure, there just isn't the funding for it. So there will be some curtailing there and obviously government-based projects, whilst they can be great sources of revenue, they they're also run risks in that they can fall out of favour. Likewise, you've got the transition to renewable energy. There's a lot of construction involved around that, where they can be exposed to that. And then the whole housing market, as we're all well aware, there's a big undersupply in housing. And so that's driving a lot of construction activity. I think this is a bit of a, a, a risk, which perhaps well, I guess it probably is being reflected, but certainly the company don't see it as as a big risk. But about 10% of their earnings are exposed to the transitional energy thematic. And what that means is that they are of the belief that demand for gas, that gas will be a transition fuel as we transition away from dirty fuels like coal and oil towards your renewable energy like solar and wind and so forth. Um, but that's not a universally accepted view. There are many that believe that gas itself is a dirty fuel and that we should be moving away from it. And so right now, you know, probably the majority of people and particularly politicians are of the view that gas is going to be around for some time and that, yes, it will have a strong role to play. But but as I said, that's not a a totally accepted view. And so there is a risk there that gas will fall out of favour and that their exposure to that could, could be a risk that they're carrying. Obviously, there's the exposure to the media sector. Now, that's obviously a risky segment. Media is not going to go away, but it's going to transition and it's it has transitioned and is likely to continue to transition. And so whether the seven network uh, are able to capitalize on that and, and do well in the years to come, that remains to be seen. And the other thing, as I mentioned at the top, if you get involved with this business, you're getting involved with the Stokes family. You know, historically, that suggests that that's a good thing. They've certainly got a good track record, but you need to be aware that if they were to decide to reduce their holdings, that would have a significant 
effect on the price. Obviously, they hold such a big stake in the business. And so, yeah, that's just something to be aware of. Not a concern, but something to be aware of. Chris Batchelor, thanks very much for joining me on this uh, great deep dive into a fantastic company. Thanks, Phil. It was a real pleasure to explain this company to the viewers, the listeners. Whoever's out there. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Thanks for listening to Shares for Beginners. You can find more at sharesforbeginners.com. If you enjoy listening, please take a moment to rate or review in your podcast player or tell a friend who might want to learn more about investing for their future. 